from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up today on Ag Day, stern sanctions against China in the form of tariffs could be on the books for today. China makes a not so subtle hint that retaliation against U.S. soybean farmers is next. Disruptions in terms of demand are really testing the nerves of farmers. In agribusiness, the funds find corn attractive, but why? The funds, if they like it at four, they like it better at 410 and they like it better at 420. Plus, the music of the mountains sometimes comes from underneath the granite and stone. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest lasting full size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Tyne Morgan. Clinton Griffiths is off today. Well, it appears the president is following through with his threat to impose sanctions against China over violations of intellectual property. The president has been considering tariffs as much as $60 billion worth on Chinese goods shipped into the U.S. Those sanctions could come today. These tariffs would be on top of the steel and aluminum tariffs that took effect last Friday. President Trump instructed U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer to investigate allegations that China steals U.S. intellectual property. The administration believes China forces American companies to transfer technological insight to Chinese firms in hopes of doing business in the Asian country. China is said to be preparing to hit back against a variety of U.S. trade actions, and it appears ag products would feel the brunt of it. As we've been reporting, soybeans, sorghum, and pork are the likely initial targets. Just this week, a government-run Chinese newspaper said in an editorial that U.S. subsidies have given American producers an unfair advantage of selling soybeans into China. It went on to say that strong, restrictive measures should be taken against subsidies and dumping of soybeans into China. It's uncertainty of trade with the United States number one soybean buyer that's weighing on farmers today. You know, anytime you have the farm economy still kind of lagging in its recovery, uh, disruptions in terms of demand are really testing the nerves of farmers. Well, between the China trade spat, the tariff action on steel and aluminum, as well as NAFTA negotiations, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer has a full plate. Lighthizer went before a key House committee Wednesday to talk about the president's active trade agenda. Betsy Gibbon joins us now with more. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer testifying at the House Ways and Means Committee hearing Wednesday, highlighting he's negotiating trade deals which will work for all Americans. At the meeting, Lighthizer vocal about renegotiating the North American Free Trade Agreement between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and chorus between the U.S. and South Korea, also saying the administration is aggressively pursuing potential agreements with the United Kingdom, Australia, and exploring the possibility with countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. All of this comes during a time as the U.S. is implementing tariffs on imported steel and aluminum products with some of those countries listed. At the same time, Lighthizer is still firm about a trade deficit between the U.S. and other countries. This year, the trade deficit in goods and services rose to $565 billion, and in goods alone it was $811 billion. Of course, these numbers, there are lots of causes for these numbers, but the president believes, and I, I also agree, that longstanding trade deficits to some extent reflect uh, market distortions and, and that they're having a negative effect on U.S. workers and businesses. Lighthizer saying the U.S. has a major trade deficit with China. He says $375 billion, so the numbers essentially got worse last year. He admits members at the hearing have a variety of views at the deficit figures. While tough talk remains, the U.S. government is backing off on one of its demands with NAFTA, which deals with auto. The U.S. is dropping a demand that all vehicles made in Canada and Mexico for export to the U.S. contain at least 50 percent U.S. content. Some hope this will smooth over tension with renegotiations moving forward. Thanks, Betsy. Meanwhile, African leaders on Wednesday signed what is being called the largest free trade agreement since the creation of the World Trade Organization. The deal creates a continental market of more than a billion people with a combined gross domestic product of more than three trillion U.S. dollars. A major goal is to boost intra-African trade and rely less on the volatility of commodity prices that affect many exports. The aim is to have the agreement in place by the end of the year, but that would require approval by 44 of the African Union's 55 member states. 
The mega merger between Bayer and Monsanto is one step closer to reality. That says the buyout overcame a major hurdle this week. On Wednesday, European Commission giving conditional approval for Bayer to buy Monsanto. Bayer CEO calling it a significant milestone. In a tweet Wednesday morning, the European Commissioner saying that the agency conditionally approved the Bayer takeover of Monsanto and that competition remains effective. Bayer already agreed to sell off its U.S. business and part of its digital farming portfolio to BASF. But now Monsanto also agreeing to divest its NEMA strike technology to BASF. The company actually pulled its NEMA strike seed treatment this year after the substance caused skin irritation among some individuals who handled the product. Now, despite recent issues in receiving U.S. regulatory approval, both Bayer and Monsanto say they remain confident the deal will still close by the second quarter of this year. Mike Hoffman joins us now with a look at crop comments. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Tyne. Today's crop comment is something we don't cover often, garlic. This garlic was planted in October in Rolling Prairie, Indiana, and this will be used for gardening purposes. And taking a look at the uh, wind speed forecast today, you can see it's starting off on the coast, kind of windy. Becomes windy in the central and southern plains as we head through the day today. Very windy out west. These are a couple of powerful storms coming in there. You can see as we head into the day tomorrow, most of the west of the uh, country, even the central part of the country, going to be very windy throughout the day tomorrow, especially during the afternoon hours. We'll have your forecast coming up, but first here are some hometown temps. Your next piece of equipment is on machinerypeat.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineRepeat.com. Still to come, why do the funds find corn so attractive? We ask Mike Flores after the break. Plus, on the heels of an omnibus spending bill vote, FSA is reminding livestock producers that more aid is available from the mounting disaster losses last fall. And later, we'll show you how the hills are alive with the sound of music, and we mean that quite literally. Ag Day, brought to you by Creden Soybean Seed from Bayer. Designed using smart genetics with tailored varieties to fit any field condition. In agribusiness, the livestock market's plunging midweek. To find out why, let's head to the floor of the CME. Cattle was lower. It seems that the cash uh, cattle uh, was lower than it was last week. and. Uh, that really sent the market uh, lower again. It's about a dollar lower, in fact, and uh, and it was ahead of the cattle auction today. So we'll see. There hasn't been much uh, lined up for the auction today, but uh, the market's kind of like sinking a little bit. It seems that the futures did break through a, a key support area. So uh, we've got some of the traders a little bit rattled. They're somewhat nervous. And uh, uh, the slaughter-ready uh, supplies uh, are are up. So that certainly means that there's going to be more you know supplies in the pipeline. It makes it and that adds to some of the pressure of the market. That's all from the floor of the CME Group here in Chicago. I'm Virginia McGaffey. Here now with Mike Flores of Flores Trading. Mike, one of the most frustrating parts about the market, and I've heard from producers continuously, is they never know what the outside money or the funds are going to do. And a lot of times that can really drive prices yeah. majorly either way. So what drives the funds? What, what motivates them? I wish I could give you a strong answer on that. It's always a mystery. It's always a black hole. But uh, money chases money. It, it is an old adage like in, in the old days, which we're not in the old days anymore. If you liked corn at $4, you liked it more at three ninety. dollars You liked it more at three eighty. dollars The funds, if they like it at 4 they like it better at four ten, and they like it better at four they They're momentum traders. And as long as the market is going their way, they continue to pile on whatever the direction is. So it's difficult to say what drives them, mm -hmm. but um, they tend to shift from one segment to another. Right now, they're kind of in love with the grains. They were in love with the livestock in the fall. And, and one of the keys to watch on them is when open interest really builds in the final days of the move. Um, it kind of signals the end of that trend. It happened in the fall in livestock, and it happened in January in crude oil. It's the, kind of the blow off. And now we've, we've just gotten it in soybeans. So why do the funds, you said the funds love grains right now. Why do they like corn? Well, because it's a low price commodity. There's not many uh, sectors that have been in bear markets for five, six years like the grains have. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of moves up in energies, livestock, uh, um, the metals at certain times, certainly right. the, the stock market, uh, they, they chase momentum. So at some point though that the momentum um, ends and you got to try to figure out as a trader you know what's your clue for that and what I found is 
a, a rapid build up in open interest typically at the end of the move is what what is the, the answer to that all right a good explanation i know there's not one silver bullet it's a hard yeah. one yeah i mean there's not a really a formula for it but you did a good job of, of trying to explain you just it have to see what, when it when somebody gets too long or too short That's you know it's not going to last forever okay. all right good to know thank you mike we appreciate it let's take a quick break and then we'll have a check of weather here on ag day for a free two-week trial to Mike's trading recommendations, call Flores Trading at 800-841-2108. Welcome back. Time now to check weather with meteorologist Mike Hoffman. Mike, I was checking out your wind speed map earlier in the show, and I heard some viewers in the Texas Panhandle around like Dalhart that were telling me last week the winds were so bad that that's what started a lot of the fires in their area. And so they're wow. bracing for a possible another round this week with all those winds. Yeah, because each of these systems uh, kind of come in the same way. A lot of the moisture is to the north of them, but the winds and the and fronts no still coming through those areas. Yeah, you can see that on the root zone moisture as well. It's dry from the uh, panhandle of Texas all the way down into the uh, Big Bend area and back throughout the Four Corner region. It's improved a little bit in California, and you've gotten more moisture since this root zone moisture was actually uh, calculated yesterday. So things are looking a little bit uh, better in those areas, although you're probably going to get too much rain, which happens a lot in California over a short period of time. Kind of wet Ohio, Tennessee valleys toward the Gulf Coast, as you can see there. Now, taking a look at the weather map, we have this uh, big storm in the northeast. Going to be ending today, but it's still snowing like crazy parts of New England. And you can see this double barrel storm coming in out west, heading through the day today, middle of the country. Nice and dry, although, like we pointed out, it's going to be fairly windy. Lots of these are southerly winds across the plain states. Heading into the day tomorrow, the north nor'easter is finally off to the east of uh, New England. And you can see these two storm systems coming through the uh, middle of the Rockies. Warm front out ahead of it will cause a little bit of rain and eventually snow farther north. And yet another system diving into the areas just off Washington, Oregon, and California, starting to produce some more rain and mountain snows by later in the day tomorrow. Taking a look at precipitation estimate past 24 hours. We've still seen uh, some pretty heavy amounts, most of that snow obviously, in the northeast, especially along the coast, and a, a whole bunch in central and northern California. And we're going to add some more in California, but then it uh, dries out for 24 hours perhaps before the next system comes in. But there's some pretty decent amounts really in both of those systems. Most of this, like I said, in New England has been snow. We're going to see a little bit more before that moves away. And we're going to see a whole bunch more in some of the higher elevations of the central and northern Rockies. Taking a look at uh, temperatures this afternoon, 70s and 80s into Texas and parts of Oklahoma, only 40s all the way down into the Ohio and Tennessee River Valleys. Taking a look at uh, low temperatures tomorrow morning, teens in the northern Great Lakes, 30s all the way down into northern Georgia. So that's some pretty chilly air, and we warm things up even a little bit more in the far southwestern plain states there. The rest of the country kind of on the chilly side because of these two troughs. You can see the northeastern one finally moving away. Ridge tries to come east to warm it up temporarily, but then this whole system just kind of bowling balls off to the east. And that's kind of interesting with that cutoff. We'll have to see how that affects things as we head through next week. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. First of all, Medford, Oregon, cooler with a bit of rain at times, high temperature of 49 degrees. Enid, Oklahoma, a mixture of sunshine and clouds and breezy, high of 77. And Huntington, West Virginia, partly sunny on the chilly side, high around 46. Still to come, why the largest fast food chain in the world is going green and the sounds of bluegrass resonate from the mountains of Tennessee. And when we say from the mountains, it's more like underneath. We'll explain later on Ag Day. While you are focused on raising the world's most nutritious beef, your checkoff is opening doors and telling consumers why beef is always a great choice. Visit MyBeefCheckoff.com to learn how else your checkoff is opening doors. The world's largest food chain is not only working to sustainably source food, but now making a major commitment to trim greenhouse gas emissions, and that includes on the farm. McDonald's announcing plans to partner with franchisees and suppliers in hopes of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 36%. It's hoping to meet that goal by 2030. It estimates that would cut 150 million metric tons of greenhouse gases. That's the equivalent of taking 32 million passenger cars off the road 
for an entire year. McDonald's says sustainability is more than just having access to food for the long term. It's engaging the entire food chain, and that starts on the farm. When we talk about agriculture, when we look at McDonald's uh, environmental and social impacts and risks, we know that the biggest social, the biggest impacts and risks happen in agriculture, and that's not a, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's that's the reality, but along with those those large impacts and risks, those are also opportunities too. And agriculture and the things that. Uh, the things agriculture can do to improve water quality, to improve carbon storage in soils, there are tremendous opportunities there, and, and farmers and ranchers are really leading the way on those, those topics. Bailey says farmers are already making great strides, but now it's key to be able to not only collect the data, and but measure what farmers are doing in order to validate the work and those improvements to customers who are curious about where their food comes from. Well, according to Drover's editor Greg Henderson, some of these sustainability practices have been implemented as part of a pilot program driven by Cargill Canada. After three months in operation, the company says the results are encouraging. The system tracks beef products from carcass to the meat counter. Cargill says the model works and demonstrates significant potential to scale the program to deliver a greater volume of certified sustainable beef. This framework, the first of its kind in the world, is a voluntary program that enables cattle producers and beef processors to demonstrate the sustainability of their operations while also supporting the retail and food service industries. Cargill says by coupling live cattle and beef product traceability, Cargill's Canadian producers can demonstrate the sustainability of their entire supply chain. Those Canadian ranchers earn $10 a head for cattle meeting the criteria. The pilot program certified more than 500,000 pounds of beef from about 70 cattle ranchers. Well, as Congress works to pass a last minute omnibus spending bill before the time runs out, livestock producers are still waiting to reap the benefits from enhanced disaster relief passed in the last budget act. Legislators pushed through disaster aid, ad hoc disaster aid that will benefit those impacted from events like the severe hurricanes and wildfires last year. Farm Service Agency says the government is now able to provide more assistance to those livestock producers dealing with loss, including a more robust aid program. That includes removing the $125,000 payment limitation on livestock death losses. Now, it also extends assistance to livestock producers that were forced to sell some of their animals after the disasters hit. It provides assistance to those situations where an animal may have been damaged as a result of a natural disaster, meaning that it wasn't um, productive any longer, and so the producer had to sell it at market, but sell it at a reduced price. It didn't die, so it didn't qualify. But now, under this bipartisan um, budget act, the language changed to allow us to include those animals that were maimed or harmed as a result of a natural disaster and sold for a reduced price. So it actually provides better assistance under that program. Now, Peterson says the agency is still working on the details, but says the benefits are retroactive to January 1st, 2017. So FSA is working to make it where producers who already reported livestock deaths don't have to reapply for the payment limitation cap to be lifted. But he says when it comes to reduced sale animals, those have not been reported in the past. So he suggests producers start pulling those sale records together now. Well, if you're not claustrophobic, you may enjoy our next story. We're headed in the country and in the caves of Tennessee. Ag Day, brought to you by Corvus, the number one pre-emergence corn herbicide. In the Country, sponsored by Kubota. Tractors, hay tools, utility vehicles, mowers, and more. Visit KubotaUSA.com today. There's plenty of history in Tennessee's music scene, but none dates back as far as a couple of concert venues in the Appalachian Mountains. That's because the venues are underground caves. Work is now underway at a concert venue called The Caverns. It's about an hour southeast of Nashville. Concert producer Todd Mayo promises a performance like you've never seen before. Now, it's not just about the bluegrass music, but the aura of natural beauty. This is not a, a set. Uh, this is not a, um, a dead cave. It's, it's a live cave and it's a, a wonderful ecosystem. And so the challenge for us has been to um, sort of preserve all of the natural elements while doing what we want to do. Mayo got its start at another underground venue called Cumberland Caves. It's about 40 miles away from the town of McMinnville. 
That concert hall can accommodate about 700 people who hike down into it. And one of its main features is a giant antique chandelier that once hung in a New York City theater. By the way, there is indoor plumbing. See, it's that indoor plumbing that's just a deal breaker for me. Well, that's all the time we have this morning. We're so glad you tuned in. For all of us at Ag Day, I'm Tyne Morgan. Have a great day in farm country. Ag Day, brought to you by Ram Commercial, America's longest-lasting heavy-duty pickups.